Okay, it's time for another, uh, what I've been calling mystery meat sack analysis. Uh, today, I've got Jonah Dempsey. Um, Hello. I've got to know, how long have I known you? It's I, barely a month, six weeks? <laughs> <laughs> Many lifetimes. Yeah. Only only a few weeks in this one. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. somehow, I we're like best friends now, which I'm yep. really excited about. Yeah, man. It's uh, I, Every time I get a text from you, I'm kind of excited because I usually learn something new. So... Um, right on. So, uh, today, today's mystery meat sack, I guess I should share it. Uh, well, and actually maybe just introduce the concepts. So the idea is I'm presenting a body graph to someone who's, uh, deep in the knowledge. I'm a MG three, five, and I bounce around and I'm picking things up as I go. This is actually my secret plan to just basically get training on human design by listening to other people <laughs> describe stuff. So it's my sneaky way of learning. Um, but the first one I did with, uh, Amanda Horvath, we did, uh, Justin Trudeau. And it was super interesting because here's the prime minister of Canada and um, she wasn't familiar with him or any, anything that was going on with it. It was perfect because what she described was someone that um, is in the, is in the right job at the right time, whether you like him or not, that guy could go home and just sit with his millions and relax. And he's instead pushing through all this stuff. And it was kind of neat viewing it with an empathic, nature. I'm just like, oh, this is a guy trying to do something and he he doesn't have to do it. So I actually felt empathy for him for the first time. So anyways, <clears throat> on to the new meat sack. So Jonah hasn't seen this, doesn't, and uh, I'm just going to double check that I haven't accidentally left the name in there. I have not. So Jonah, this is, uh, well, I'll move the, uh, this little footer guy here too. All right. Candidate. Now, I found two uh, body graphs for this person, but this seems to be the most accurate. In some cases, based on a couple hours difference, uh, this person is a projector. Um, but this seems to be more accurate based on what I can, could find. I, I can't particularly call this person and ask them <laughs> to confirm. Sure. For a time, so. So yeah, 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 and so the idea is to do a kind of analysis of this chart, um, right? And I guess you know, I I, I was going to say, uh, Ra famously did a twelve or thirteen week course on Timothy Leary, where he just did a very deep dive on Timothy Leary's chart, looking at different aspects of it, looking at the substructure, looking at his environment, his view, his cognition, all of these things, and. I guess what I would say is just for me to do a reading, there's kind of two, two ways to approach it. It's like, if I'm doing the reading for like, say this person came to me and they're just my client. And that's very different than to take Ra's approach where he kind of uses this person as an example for teaching. And I think it's harder for me to act as if they're my client, because when someone comes to me for a reading, I really cater that reading to them. And I'm speaking a lot to them. So someone who came with this chart, I would be talking to them a lot about their undefined spleen. I would be like urging them to kind of think of where they can let go of, of things in their chart, where they've been holding on to things that aren't good for them. I mean, I kind of immediately noticed it's a completely undefined spleen with only two hanging gates pointing at it. So if this person came to me, I would really spend a lot of time um, just trying to help them decondition from the undefined spleen, even just help them see it. Because when you have this much openness in a center there, that undefined spleen, that amount of openness leads to a real blind spot in the chart. Hmm. It's not like um, their head, Ajna, is not as much of a blind spot. Head, I guess, because it's only unconscious activation. Uh, but, you know, their openness, this is someone who has an incredibly packed throat center. This throat center is, I mean, there's 11 gates in the throat. They have nine of them. This wow. is packed. So not only is this person a manifester, an ego and emotional manifester, I guess what we would call an emotional manifester, but with a defined ego, but they also just have this packed throat. And uh, so they probably have a lot of visibility into that, but they don't necessarily have it visibility into what they're holding on to that isn't good for them. They also have a completely undefined root with only two hanging gates pointing at it, both of which are unconscious. So I guess all I'm saying is if they were coming to me as a client, mm -hmm. I would kind of be working on helping them uh, maybe see some of these blind spots and really get to, to notice uh, some of the conditioning in those centers. 
But as a teaching tool, I think what we would do is maybe just describe them is, you know, it's a little bit different. It's a little more like, what is this person like? You know, what, what is this person going to, um, and so it's a kind of a different question, right? Like for instance, um, I think in, in Ra's example of Timothy Leary, he talked about how Timothy Leary is caves and Timothy Leary ended up in prison. Well, prisons are, are kind of cave environment. And he kind of pointed out Timothy Leary's mind probably had a really hard time being in prison, but his body might not have minded it as much. It's a safe place. It's controlled. It's, you know, so it's kind of funny. It's, it's like that kind of thing, that dichotomy. Interesting. Um, I think it's um, what I just want to always point out, like it, it can't be easy being on this end because I know who it is. And yeah. usually it includes when you talk to someone too, like, does this resonate for you? Because you're also checking to make sure that they're, you got the right information and does it. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I do a lot of blind readings. I don't, I don't, I do what Ra did, which is that he didn't like to know information about the person first because he wanted to describe the mechanics. So, but I, I guess it's also just, but you are right that it is a little different because if I know it's for someone, then I'm, I'm basically like, I'm always going to be speaking to the person listening. So if I'm doing a reading for someone, I'm really trying to get through to them and so I'm looking at what might be a difficult way to get through. Like this person, it would be very hard to reach um, their understanding about the undefined spleen and the root because those areas, I mean, even the sacral, although there's enough hanging gates pointing at it, you have, uh, and you have four conscious and, and one unconscious, um, you know, you, you have five gates pointing at, at the sacral center. So because of that, the sacral center has more visibility into it. So I think what I would look at for this person is that in a reading, my challenge would be how can I explain to them the spleen and the root in a way that they could really grasp it? Because when you have that little visibility into it, it's a real blind spot. Uh, Ra gives three keynotes for the fully open centers that have very little activation pointing at them. And those three keynotes are denial, projection, and blame. So here's somebody who you say, you know, it seems like you're holding on to a grudge. You really should just forgive that person. And they go, oh, no, 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 I don't have grudges. I'm not the kind of person that has grudges. That's denial, right? It's a blind spot. And then you say, well, it seems like you're really holding on to something that isn't good for you. I mean, you still haven't gotten over this relationship or you still haven't let go of this thing. You seem to be kind of living in the past, like you're, you're very much wishing things could be different, you just need to let go. I mean, this is spleen stuff, right? Let go, move on. And they go, no, other people have that problem. I'm so lucky, I've never had that problem. Not when I was younger, not now. That's never been a problem for me. But then meanwhile, projection and blame. And they're saying, ah, other people are just so clingy. Other people are just, they. why won't they just let go of it? Why won't they just drop it? That was ages ago. Why are they holding on to it still? So there's this feeling that other people are holding on to things. I'm not holding on to things, you know, and the same with the root. You'd be like, hey, slow down. You know, there's no hurry. And they'd say, oh, I'm never in a hurry. And then they would complain. Other people are constantly rushing me. Other people are constantly pushing me to hurry up. I don't get it. It's like they don't really know how to slow down and relax. Mm -hmm. So when you have that much openness, it's very hard to get through to somebody to um, really explain to them how, how those dynamics work because it's such a blind spot, it's very difficult typically for them to see it. So, and then we just have so much focus on the throat here. I mean, it really is an impeccably activated throat. And uh, in astrology, this would be a ton of Gemini. You know, this person is, is like full Gemini. I think they have all five gates of Gemini activated, you know. Um, a very, very um, mercurial communicating, but also taking action. We know that the throat center is the throat of metamor or is the center of uh, metamorphosis. That the throat is not just for talking, but it's also for manifesting. It's for changing, transforming. This person's a manifester. I mean, a manifester is. Um, it's it's kind of scary being a manifester. A manifester is here to bring about change. And change is scary for everyone, even manifestors, right? They're here to bring about metamorphosis. And they have only one manifestor channel, but they have all these hanging gates that are just ready to plug in 
And so it really is, uh, it's, I mean, it's quite a chaotic throat center, but a very powerful, very strong, heavily activated throat. I would say um, it might be difficult for this person to actually know which of those gates is, is connected to their authority because what's truly going to guide them is the clarity that emerges from the feeling process. And it's actually the voice of, I feel, gate 35. So when they say, I felt really bad, but I don't feel bad anymore. Or I felt like everything was okay, but now I feel like it's not really going the right direction. Or things like that. That would actually help them get in touch with their authority. But that's unconscious. And they might be much more uh, identified with gate 12, their personality son, right? So they might be much more in the... Um, Basically, 12 is, is going to be more about knowing, and it's going to be about knowing um, whether they should try or not. So they might say, well, I know it's worth a try. I, I know I can try. It's like, the, it's like trying. It's like striving in a way. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, let me just, just a second here. Um, Do you want me to click on anything there? Like, by all means. Uh, yeah, you can leave, leave 12 open. That, that's that's okay. useful. Um, so... The, this person has all but but two of the of the voices. So they have. So here's somebody who. Uh, so okay. So their real their authority is connected to I feel, but their personality son is in twelve, which is about trying, or it can also be about taking action. Like I'm acting now. I'm doing now in a way. Um, but they also have forty five, which is about having and they have 33 i mean they have so many it's like this is somebody who really can can really they they have a tremendous ability to share a tremendous ability to communicate i mean this is someone who can communicate quite a bit with their 1333 they're obviously they have the, they have leadership and there's different kinds of leadership in the chart uh, they have 45 which is the tribal leader they have 31 which is the logical leader but both of those are only hanging gates. They still imbue those qualities. I mean, here's somebody who could be seen as the head of a tribe, but they could also be seen as somebody who's very logical. But the one that actually is connected to their life force energy uh, that actually is a channel is their 3313. And this is the abstract leader. And the abstract leader helps us make sense of the past. It's really here to help us understand how we got to be where we are. In fact, um, that's the channel. I'm pretty sure it's the only channel uh, Barack Obama has. Mm -hmm. He's a 3313 projector. And the thing about these different kinds of leadership, the 45, the tribal leader is really there. That's the Don Corleone. That's the Tony Soprano. So that gate 45 in the throat, that's there to really be the head of the tribe, the voice of the tribe, and to be an advocate and to speak on behalf of the haves and the have-nots. And to say on behalf of the have-nots, we we don't have enough, we need more, and so on, and to kind of, and, and ultimately their role is to educate the tribe. The good tribal leader will always educate and will always help elevate and be, and this is all about advocacy for those who don't have the resources. The logical leader, um, which is the 731, in, in this case, this person has the 31, that is really, um, it's kind of like Leonardo DiCaprio's character in Don't Look Up, where they're the untested leader. They're the hypothetical leader. They're the leader that's only ever um, learned through practice, or through, I mean, it's not even practice, but through like, like scientific theory and experiment. And so theoretically, they're a good leader. In that film, for those who haven't seen it, he's a scientist who says, I've calculated, him and his partner have calculated the trajectory of a meteor that's gonna hit the earth. But people say, well, how do you know it's gonna hit the earth? Well, we have all the science to show it. That is 31 in a nutshell. It shows the science, but it doesn't have the experience. Well, you've never been in this position before. You, don't, you haven't gained the experience for it. Mm -hmm. Well, this person is the 3313, and that's the experiential leader. The abstract leader is the experiential leader. And that's the leader that they're always saying it's not yet their time, like their time will come. 
And then they become leader when it's their time. It's their time to shine. But then they've been leader for a while and people say, oh, they're too old. That was their time to shine. Now they're too old. They, you know, so it's a, it's a leader with a lifespan. It's not like the logical leader that can just be a leader forever or the tribal leader. You basically have to kill them to get rid of them. I mean, they're a leader for life. That 45 never stops being a leader. The 33 is the leader for a time. It's not yet mature enough. Then it matures. It's like you don't have enough experience. But then finally, okay, you have enough experience. We're gonna, you're gonna be the leader now. Oh, you have too much experience. You can't be the leader anymore. You've, you've overshot it now. And so that's kind of, um, it's funny because they're the ones who are really just leader for a certain period of time when they've reached maturation, but not for too long, not when they get tired and worn out, so to speak. Hmm. So uh, this person only has one fully conscious channel, which is interesting. It's the 3740. So that 3740, I guess I would say that, I mean, we know that's the design of a part seeking the whole, that this is somebody who is looking for a group to be a part of. And that the group is going to be, um, even though they are born on an individual son, uh, the group is going to be very important for them. Yeah, this person's a Gemini, gate 12, line 4. That would be like um, uh, June 16th, 17th, somewhere in there. And um, yeah, and, and so even though they're an individual, and, they're, and you know, the other thing is they're on the cross of Eden, which 12 on the cross of Eden, it's, it's kind of... All Edens are, they've been kicked out of Eden and they're kind of looking for their Eden. Being a fourth line, this might be kind of like this person is trying to rediscover their Eden. And then when they do, they're just going to externalize it. They're just going to communicate it out in a fixed way to others. It's kind of like the first line is like, what, you know, what is Eden really? And they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to rebuild it. They're, they're trying to figure out Eden the cross of Eden people are always kicked out of Eden, which the ultimate Eden is childhood. The ultimate Eden is ignorance. And when they're kicked out of it, they're basically thrown into the world and they're forced to experience what the world has to offer. And this is the uh, 36, six. And you see it in the, um, the two left angles of the cross of Eden, which is the cross of migration and the cross of the plane and the cross of migration, or I guess, um, yeah, I mean, th th these are themes of being out in the world basically. But the Eden people just want to kind of stay in their Eden. So the fourth line Eden, they're really, uh, you know, they're either going to, they're going to have found their Eden and then tell everybody that they found it or, right. Or it's kind of, it's externalizing Eden. It's like, a, it's like 12, one would be trying to find what it is. 12, two is just leave me alone. I'm already in my Eden. They're the, they're the, the people who just don't like, they're kind of like the hermit of Eden. Like, let me stay in my Eden. Don't, don't change it. I don't want it to change. Uh, you find a lot of second line Edens who have a certain era or a certain time frame that they just love. I knew a second line cross of Eden who loved the 1960s and everything she had was 1960s clothes and 1960s music. That was her Eden. It's like, don't make me face the world in 2020. I want to be in the 1960s. So I'm going to go to the funk night and listen to the 45s and have old record players and dress in old clothes. And that's my Eden. Uh, you know, there was a, a good joke from Ra. He said, if you really want to antagonize a second line on the cross of Eden, go in their house when they're not home and move all their furniture. They'll never speak to you again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> 12, three would be trial and error getting to Eden and kind of, you know, analysis, and this is where we get therapy. But see, we have to realize also that there's different arms of the Cross of Eden, right? A 36 on the Cross of Eden is going to be very different. That's kind of the innocence lost theme compared to the six on the Cross of Eden, which is going to be about bonding. And then the 11 on the Cross of Eden, peace and, uh, and ideas that come from that. 12 on the Cross of Eden is the only throat gate um, really of the individual aimed at connecting to the other because there's other individual gates. There's the 23, which I guess explains to the other, and there's the eight, which contributes to the other. And there's the 20, which is both integration and individual. And it can, it, it can be the voice of the now and so on. But the 12 is like the only individual social gate in that it's truly trying to 
get information across to mutate the other. It's really trying to convey into a social environment. And so a 12-4, I mean, fourth lines, they have one concern and one concern only, which is how effectively they're communicating what they're trying to get across. They're not asking if what they're trying to get across is valid. They're not asking if it could be improved. They're not asking if it could be thrown away as something new that could come along. They're not asking what it really means or trying to understand how it works. They're not, it's none of these things. The fourth line is simply, how could I better convey this? So if they present information and it doesn't go over well, say it's a new scientific theory and they explain it. And then the scientists say, well, there's a bunch of assumptions and falsehoods in that theory. Um, you know, I think you should throw away that theory and try something else because a lot of scientists are third lines. So they'll find what's wrong with it. Uh, the fourth line doesn't assume there's anything wrong with it. They say, nope, the theory is sound. The theory is perfect. Nothing wrong with it. Uh, I must not have communicated it well enough. So they always go back to how do I rephrase it so that you can understand it? And it's basically the last resort to actually throw something away. That's called abdicating. And the only way they will do that is if their entire network of support turns against them and tells them, and then the sort of pressure of the group forces them to abdicate. So yeah, this is somebody who's very concerned with communicating to the tribe, with getting their point across, with figuring out, it's probably a very likable person, I would imagine, pretty affable. Fourth lines have this like universal friend kind of feel to them. Um, it's kindness, meanness, but they tend to show kindness and charity to people. Um, if the variables are correct, I, I guess it depends on the birth time. I'm always skeptical of like round number birth times, you know, 2.30 a.m. is that actually yeah. correct? Uh, but if it is, then then this person would be fairly receptive and kind of more laid back. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I, I guess if I were to describe them, I would say they're, they're here. They're probably, um, they probably love travel with their 35, 36. They're probably, uh, very friendly and well-liked, um, with the throat here, it's very, uh, good communicators, clear communicators. And then if I were to look at the not self, I would say that it's probably very well hidden. They might not show it as much because it's so undefined, but that they, they may just hold on to a lot of resentments and grudges, hold on to the past in many ways. Um, obviously not knowing when, you know, enough is enough, overdoing it, pushing themselves too hard, crazy work schedule, too much, you know, working too hard, too fast. And then they may also be very preoccupied with bigger abstract questions that just don't matter. Their nodes are 64, 63. And anytime you see these gates, I mean, they're kind of, um, that's of course a polarity from the cross of consciousness. And they also have, um, oh, they have 15, not five, I see, but they have 35. So they have some of, they almost have the cross of consciousness, but yeah, here's somebody, you know, kind of as an extra cross, um, probably has a lot of big questions about things that don't matter. You could mm -hmm. say. Interesting. So. Um, well, yeah. So I got, I wrote a bunch of notes here because <laughs> like a couple of things are just going ding, 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 ding. Sure. Um, do you want to know who it is or do you want to like, well, I, I, you can tell me your notes first. Let's do the reveal at the very end. Okay. So um, the talking points I wrote down, uh, this person can hold some grudges, but they're well hidden. And as soon as you said that, I like, I can just think <laughs> things uh, certainly the throat um, and communicating. How can I better, you know, storytelling um, leadership, both tribal and logic. I thought was very interesting uh, when I think of this person. Um, yeah, head of tribe, on behalf of the tribe, looking for a group to be part of, certainly likable and universal appeal and laid back, or at least the impression of, and loves travel. So Yeah, yeah. And also, I guess one more thing to add is that this is a Penta person, so they probably work well with the group. And if they are a celebrity, most celebrities have some sort of entourage that is helping present them to the world or kind of organizing. And so, yeah, are we going to do it? Yeah, so I didn't want to give away the city because you probably would have guessed the person right away. Beatles? Yeah. Oh, my word. Oh, it's Paul. 
Oh, yeah. wow. And it's interesting you mentioned the Penta because I actually uh, did, a, like, I don't. Well, know. yeah, I mean, the Beatles are the ultimate Penta of the ages. I mean, that's, I'm glad I got that last little shot in. Yeah. That's great. That oh, funny? my <laughs> word. I had no idea Paul has such an incredibly packed throat. I mean, he, he came sense. into this life ready to go. He's like, I'm on a mission. I'm here to reach as many people as possible. Because, you know, 12 is going to reach the 22s. It's like, if you think of the throat gates as what's going out, and then the gates on the other end is what's receiving them. So what is the most universally appealing? I mean, uh, much to John and the others' chagrin, I think Paul's songs tend to be the ones most covered and the ones most, I mean, it's kind of like, oh, like you have 22. Okay, you're going to like listening to a 12. Oh, you have 21. You're going to like listening to a 45. Oh, you have one. It's kind of like, how do I just get everyone to enjoy listening to me? Mm -hmm. Incarnate with nine out of 11 throat gates. Yeah. And so, yeah, even that, uh, so many things. The first point was grudges. I have noticed, because as soon as you said it, I was just like, bing, 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 bing. His story about like how Michael Jackson stole the music rights or the story of the whole. Really? Movie. I didn't know that. I mean, I thought Mac and Jack was a thing. Like they were uh, Paul McCartney and Michael Jackson, Mac and Jack. They were like a combo in the 80s. Did they have a falling out after that? Or Yeah, well, uh, the story goes that, and, and Paul's told it, but always is like, oh, I don't like when people ask me this, but I've seen the story told 10 times on 10. So he has he has no problem telling the story. But um, yeah, he gave Michael advice and said, you know, make sure you own the publishing rights. And so to songs, your and I think he meant specifically his his songs, Michael Jackson went and bought the Beatles song rights, and so that they became yeah. unfriends after that. So that's my memory of it anyways. And then just, yeah, like he he's always very cute and comforting in interviews, but always says, oh, I don't like telling the story, but then he absolutely does. <laughs> and, and repeatedly. So he's getting his, he's getting to throw his digs in there, but always being the nice, likable guy. And it, and I believe he is. But yeah, it's just once he pointed that out, I was like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. There it is. So, Well, and it's, yeah, so with this much undefined, I mean, wow. Um, I mean, that spleen and that root, it, like it's probably hard for him to be in touch with any of that. He seems so nice. That's the fourth line, but also just – he's, you know, he's probably not in touch with that side of him that might hold a grudge, for instance. So he could be holding grudges he's not even aware of, or he could be holding on to old outdated opinions that to help defend him or old views or old. I mean, when you have that much openness, it's kind of like, I'm going to never let go of anything that I found that works for me, whether or not it still is good, whether or not it still works, whether or not it's still healthy, because there's an extreme distrust of other people. When you have an entirely open channel, like that 1858, totally open, 2838, entirely open, 3254, open, 60, or sorry, 5027, open, all of these open channels, um, 4426, right? these completely open channels, that's basically a feeling, it's very similar to a wide split. If you ever analyze wide splits and how they tend to blame other people, uh, it's the same thing here where the blame is basically, I have to do it all myself because I can't trust anyone else to do it because they always fail me. So with 54, 32, 44, 26, totally open, it's like, I can't trust anyone else to do my business. I have to do it. I can't trust anyone else for my career. I have to do it myself. I can't trust anyone else to help help me in any of these things. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody else is responsible. You know, 5027 is all about taking responsibility. But when it's totally open between two undefined centers like that, it's basically like, I've never met a responsible person in my life. So then he's going to hold on to things he's going to hold on to responsibilities that aren't good for him. He's going to be kind of a micromanager control freak over not letting people help him in those ways. You mean now, like obviously, but well, he is a Pinto person. So obviously in other ways he will, and he has that 3740. So in other ways he'll, he'll be open to collaboration with others. It's not that it's just um, that much openness is basically like, these are areas where we, tend to endlessly rationalize the not self theme by saying that the other person can't handle it. Mm -hmm. Because when you, have, when you have that much openness, it's like this feeling that nobody's there, that nobody in the world could actually solve that problem. Like, oh, I don't ask for help because nobody could help me anyway. You know, that, that kind of thing. I, I have to do it myself because nobody's really there for me. Whereas when you have the hanging gates pointing at the center, at least, at least then you feel like, 
okay, maybe I have a chance. There's someone on the other side waiting for me or, you know, or vice versa. If you have a hanging gate pointing off, it's kind of like, okay, I've experienced what it's like to connect with somebody who knows how to do this. Mm -hmm. When it's that open, it's kind of like, nobody really knows how to do this. I'm totally alone in this world, in these areas. And that's used as a mental rationalization for the not self theme. So this would be like, hey, Paul, you should let go of that. It's not serving you. Well, first of all, I'm not letting, I, there's nothing to let go of because I'm not holding on to anything. There's the denial. Second, I am holding on to it, but it's because I have to. You know, there's a really funny logic. Um, Freud had this great example of the circular logic of rationalization of how the mind can rationalize things. And the guy borrows a stove or he borrows a pot from his neighbor and then he brings it back and it's broken. And the neighbor says, hey, it's broken. And the guy says, I never borrowed it. And plus it was broken when I got it. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it's like, it's like these kind of like opposite, you know, these statements that don't really fit, but that's mm -hmm. how the mind works. It makes up, it's like, I'm not holding on to things that aren't good for me. And besides I have to hold on to them. Nobody else will help me. You know? mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of how it works there. That's well, nice. I just have, I have one side comment, uh, yeah. which is just, I got really into this website, reincarnationresearch.com. And this was last year. In my first line studies, you know, I, yeah, it's a really cool site. Check it out, Reincarnation Research. And uh, I really like it. It's, it's .com. There it is. It's right below. Yeah, that WordPress. And so uh, there's this guy, Walter Simku. He does some really interesting ones. I don't agree with all of his analyses. There he's saying Billy Eilish is Kurt Cobain. I don't see that one as much. I mean, I, I don't really have a strong opinion either way on that. Um, but if you look up Paul McCartney, oh, <laughs> who are you looking up now? I'm curious. Fox, is it, I, I think I might be reincarnated. I might've been the captain of the Titanic. There's been so many reasons. What? That, yeah. Oh, wow. Bombshell. I want to know. I want to know that. That's, uh, that, I, that think would be, I, I would love to follow up on that with you, but Paul McCartney is thought to be Vivaldi and, it really makes a lot of sense to me because I love Vivaldi's music and I love McCartney's music. And when you hear a song like um, Paul McCartney's favorite pop song ever is by not a song he wrote, but uh, it's by Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys. It's God only knows. Mm -hmm. dun, 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 dun. You know, and you listen to that song that sounds like some Baroque classical music. I mean, the French horns and all the stuff and obviously Sergeant Pepper and all the music that the Beatles did in response uh, to the Beach Boys, to Pet Sounds, um, which is an incredible story in itself, you know, how, how Pet Sounds um, and, and Sergeant Pepper had this great kind of interplay. Yeah, but no, please, please, let's see. Let's look, let's look him up. Edward yeah, Smith. No, that's interesting. Um, I also think my wife might have been um, Jackie Robinson. So I'm not sure how I feel about being married to a former um, <laughs> very famous athlete, but... <laughs> um, well actually, i i would love to okay. yeah i'd love to follow up on some of this and you know what's interesting is um and you can also email him i've, I've emailed walter simcoe i even left him a voicemail but he never got back to me but uh but uh the interesting thing is in human design there's this idea of essentially the mutative core of humanity following basically the same mathematics as atomic versus dark matter which we could think of as hot versus cold matter in some sense. Um, not to derail too much, but in human design, we study the two laws of the universe, I guess, the two laws of the biverse. There's the law of the universe, which is Einstein's relativity, which is four dimensions, the three spatial dimensions plus time. And then there's the five dimensions of base theory. And you could basically divide this between atomic the, the biverse is between atomic and non-atomic matter and energy, dark matter, dark energy. And what you find is around 4% of the known universe, according to scientists, is atomic matter. The rest is dark matter and dark energy. Well, similarly, around 4% of the world population at any given time is the avant-garde. And in fact, 4% of the 4% is the ultra-mutative core. Yeah. And at the, at the world's current population, that's around 12 million people. But as of 1781, the advent of the nine centered being, that was only around 1 million people because uh, population has grown 12 times since then. Mm 
And if you go back to ancient Egypt, it's around 150,000 people. And if you go back before uh, 5,000 years ago, it's hard to get accurate metrics or you know numbers on the world population. But it's thought that the world population remained meta-stable or pseudo-stable for around 90,000 years at around 5 million people. Like for a very long time, the population wouldn't really grow that much. It would grow, but then it had kind of checks and balances because there were certain technological innovations and certain things that hadn't been developed, agricultural and so on, that prevented the growth beyond a certain scale of humanity. Mm -hmm. So for tens of thousands of years, humanity world population was around 5 million, which puts the mutative core at that time of only 8,000. Mm -hmm. Now here's something that Ra doesn't always talk about, but from private conversations with people who knew him, this was actually at the conference last year, it seems that Ra was of the opinion that all of the historical world figures who kind of changed history were part of this fractal line group, very closely interconnected. Fractal lines is a term he uses to basically mean kind of like the degrees of, of you know, separation, like the six degrees of Kevin Bacon that people play, how we're all connected to somebody through. But that these, these groups are very self-organizing and that every key point in history, whether it's the signing of the Declaration of you know, Independence or whether it's going back to the diaspora out of Africa or to early developments in mathematics in the you know, Middle East or any of these, these groups were these self-organizing little groups that self-selected, kind of like in ancient Greece, right? There'd be these self-selected groups of senators or of different um, philosophers and scientists and so on and artists and creators, and they would, I mean, you can see these mutative hubs. Um, even as recently as the 1920s, there was one in Switzerland, in Ascona, Switzerland, where Carl Jung would be regularly having dinner with Albert Einstein, Hermann Hesse, and a series of, you know, um, you know, Duncan, the great dancer. And I mean, there would be everyone from anarchists and communists over to philosophers, to scientists, to psychologists, to artists, to dancers. Uh, the Dada art movement is another example, surrealism, I mean, all, all of these movements. So I guess my point is, if you look at history through the lens of mutative cores, you really find that it's a very small group of people who self-organize. And the idea from Ra is that this was an incarnative core, that the vast majority of people are probably first and only lifers who are really here for the very first time, which kind of explains why people aren't great drivers or they're not even great walkers sometimes. You're out walking and somebody just stands right in front of you and you know they, they don't they lack situational awareness. Mm -hmm. Whereas other people who are part of the who first incarnated, you know, 50,000 years ago as part of that mutative core when the world population was only eight million, or sorry, five million, at that point there were only eight thousand people in the mutative core. So you can kind of imagine like a little bit of a speed run uh, that there are some films like this, like the, have you seen the film free guy or have you seen uh, the Tom Cruise movie um, where he dies and get, it's kind of like groundhog day. Have you seen groundhog day? You know, oh, for sure. yeah. yeah, he lives the day over and over. Well, there's a Tom Cruise movie where he does that as well. It's called yeah. like ready, die, repeat or something, or, you know, live, die, repeat. And that's kind of what, what these mutative core people were doing if we go back 50,000 years ago, they're born and then they get eaten by a saber toothed tiger. Okay. Come right back next time they avoid getting eaten by, but you know, they come back so many times, time after time, after time, and they don't have recall of, of what they learned in that past life. But Ra said that there's a sort of a, the way that a river wears down a mountainside. That's how, because the crystal comes back in the next life, it's sort of worn the neutrino stream has worn grooves in the crystal that are retained from previous lives, so to speak. And so after 100 lives, 200 lives, 500 lives, 1,000 lives, they kind of have gotten this kind of speed run attitude where they come in and they know how to move in the world and they don't have to learn from square one. Um, an interesting idea. I mean, this is all very much what Ra would call gray. Uh, you know, he had his black books and his white books Black was mechanics, white was um, purely interpretation, and then gray was kind of in the middle where it's based on what the voice said, 
but sort of the the yeah so and what is this egg no 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 sorry i didn't mean I, I didn't no mean... no no that's a good this is a good place to segue so this this uh video i saw and there's actually sort of a campy 70s music theater type type one as well it's about eight minutes long it's called the egg and it's basically about reincarnation and basically you know the next time you you pick the destination this the meat sack for your soul which is basically <laughs> your design date is the way i see it um you know, you might go back in time or go forward in time or end up as a different person. And this, oh, I, I literally shared this video a couple of days ago, like reshared it. And I basically was just talking about after seeing this video, I felt differently about death and dying. Like all of a sudden I went from being afraid of it or afraid of others dying to being like, you know, I don't really know because I don't remember being dead before, <laughs> but it put my mind at ease that, wow, you yeah, know, maybe this is how this works. And it, it makes a lot of sense, this reincarnation thing, everything you've been talking about today, where I feel I'm at right now with this, like I went from thinking I had one kick at the can in life to being like, oh no, this, I, I feel okay that this is. You know. Well, you're definitely part of the mutative core. So um, yeah, I think <laughs> feel okay about that. W would you go, I definitely want to check that out, but I, I think um, I, I wanted to mention really quick, on back to the reincarnation research website. Could you just mm -hmm. go there really quick? Can you look up Ra Uru Hu? This might be a, an interesting. Yeah. So this one is pretty cool. And if you look at pictures, I mean, that picture is okay, but most of the pictures of William Kwan Judge. He actually has a kind of a fez mystical hat on. And I mean, even just in that one, he looks quite a lot like Ra. Now, it's not that there's always going to be such a strong physical resemblance, especially where the gender has changed. Or, um, But I think this one, this one definitely fits. This one is pretty much confirmed in my mind. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember why I thought I felt I was Edward Smith, the captain of the Titanic, other than my genetic trauma is shame <laughs> um, that I ended up in Belfast last summer and totally forgot that that's where they built the ship and ended up like, I just felt eerie at the site, which are probably a lot of people do, but there was a bunch of, no, the, the, those are also, I mean, there's a lot of phenomena that you can look for such as synchronicities, but there's also anniversary phenomena like his birthday or his death day. And then certain synchronistic things that just tend to follow you around. So that mm -hmm. could absolutely uh, be part of it. Well, with, with Jackie Robinson, so that's that's uh, number 42, right? The famous uh, black baseball player that broke into the sport. Absolutely, uh, he, yeah. He died like seven hours before my wife was born. And But on that day, there was all these things. And I was like, do you get to pick your meat sack seven hours later? Is You know, there, I know there's this whole... Leap that, would be an, that would be a case, did he die of old age or how did he die? I don't actually remember. I think, I think he died naturally, but I, I am not sure. Okay, yeah, um, this might be a good topic for our, our next our next podcast to really dig into some of the nuances here. Because uh, and also check out reincarnation research. This website mm -hmm. they discuss some of those nuances, um, but there is the phenomena of new incarnation occurring when someone is still alive. But in that case, that person typically has Alzheimer's and it's an interesting explanation for a sort of loss of their personality while they're still alive. Like is Alzheimer's what happens when the personality crystal leaves and the person is sort of only able to somewhat channel uh, that personality crystal. There's a lot of interesting questions there and in how incarnation works. Um, so I think yeah. that would be a good, I see we're pretty much at time. That would be a good, uh, maybe a good topic yeah. for a deep dive. Cause you know, I love deep dives. I have well, that 952 channel. I've heard it. Uh, I've heard that one described. My, my friend Barbara said that that's the scuba diver channel. So oh, yeah, yeah. I like to go scuba diving. I do the deep dives. Well, I, dude, I'm, I'm always amazed at the level of depth and things you can call up here. Like it blows my mind. So I don't, I don't know how you do it. Um, well, yeah, I always enjoy deep diving with you. You have, you have a great mind for it as well. And, the, uh, um, the Alzheimer's thing, like disassociation and trauma is, you know, like if you just are like, fuck it, I'm out of here. Like you just basically clock out and all that's left is this meat sack with a 
I don't know, an NPC soul. I don't know what, what happens. But, uh, well, it would be it's unconscious. I mean, it's, it's with the design crystal still because the design crystal returns to the Earth's mantle, which is basically Jung's collective unconscious, the design crystal bundle after death. So it sticks around. The design crystal sticks around. But yeah, it is. It's like there's two souls basically. There's the eternal soul and there's the temporal soul. Um, in some sense, that's kind of what the Phoenicians believed. Actually, they believed in two souls. Hmm. So. It's definitely a new area for me, but interesting. All right. Uh, well, why don't why don't we do this again sometime? And um, yeah, thanks for hanging with me, man. It was awesome. I would love that. And great chart. I'm a huge fan of Paul McCartney and the Beatles. Always going to be a John fan. Most of all, he's closest to, to my heart, but Paul is, uh, is quite an interesting one. And one final little shout out for those uh, getting into the incarnational research. There's a man named Benjamin Cream who did this incredible work. Uh, it's kind of adjacent to the Theosophical Society where he took the Theosophical levels of uh, initiation, they call it. And the idea is that in each incarnation, we go through levels to try to gain a higher level to be initiated into a new consciousness, a new phase of, of life, and so on. And interestingly, he would publish, he published thousands of the levels of, you know, initiation for different people over, over the years uh, in his magazine, Share International, which is a fantastic magazine. And the level of initiations for the Beatles, so first of all, most of the world is around 0 0.3. Most of the world. In your first incarnation, you start at 0 or 0 0.1. Attaining level 1 is already a huge and very difficult achievement, and it's basically what human design is trying to get people to do. At level 1, you will no longer trust an outer authority. And they even use the term authority. They even describe, this goes back to the 1800s, where the Theosophical Society, which makes sense, founded by William Kwan Judge, the previous incarnation of Ra, in theory, um, that level one can only be achieved when you can say a meaningful statement about yourself and when you no longer trust your priest, your parents, your boss, your partner, your, you know, you really are trusting uh, um, the spiritual reality within that is speaking to you directly. You're trusting yourself. Uh, so just for a little context, so only around 800,000 people are said to be alive at any given point that have attained level one. It's kind of a rare group. But of the Beatles, Ringo was not listed, but presumed around 0 0.3. So concerned with money and fame and happiness and hedonism and pleasure and just kind of the basics of, of life. Um, George Harrison was 0 0.9. So he was right on the edge. And actually, if you want to pop over to reincarnation research really quick, just for one second, I know we're kind of wrapping up. Just, just look up George Harrison really quick. I, I know this is the deep dive. I know, I know, I know, but just for a second. So George Harrison was said to be at level 0 0.9, where he was still a scientific rationalist. He still didn't believe in the reality of the spirit. He didn't really believe, but he was trying. This is why he was interested in, you know, Ravi Shankar and meditation and psychedelic states. And so he, at the end of his life, he died having attained 0 0.9. Presumably he, he got right to the door of, of level one. He just couldn't step through that door. So maybe in this life as Grace Vanderwall, if this is correct, he now may be, or she now may be uh, in level one or somewhere having attained that. Um, John Lennon was said to have been level 1.6 by the time of his passing. Wow. And Paul McCartney was said to have started life at level 3.5 because that's how far he had gone in his previous lives as Vivaldi and others. And of course, he's still alive, so we don't know how far he may have even attained further levels of spiritual development. He could be working on his fourth level of initiation uh, and so on. So very fascinating area of research and those who get into the nitty gritty of the mystical, I guess you could say the nitty gritty of the wishy-washy, uh, definitely check out Theosophy, check out Benjamin Cream and the levels of initiation and uh, you will have a feast of interesting conjectures to dig yeah. into. Cool. Well, you know what? We better stop talking now. Um, but um, till next time, buddy. That was Thank fun. you. Thanks for having me. See you.